Hello, hello, Facebook land. Hoshinden students, Hoshindenka and Buyu. It is eight o'clock. <laughs> My clock is still one hour fast. That's why I, um, <laughs> I always look a bit shocked when I look up over the iPad. Um, it is eight o'clock Friday night, Friday the 24th of April, and it's time for session five of Hoshinden philosophy and theory. So welcome guys, I'll give a couple of minutes for everyone to, um, to come online and join us in the chat. As usual, as always, lots of fun. Um, I really enjoy watching the chat as you guys talk to each other and, and write messages back and forth while I'm giving these discussions and, and discourses. Um, and every now and then you really catch me off guard and I laugh at the joke. So definitely remember to chat with each other and, um, and use this opportunity for these Friday night videos as a way of um, maintaining the social cohesion and maintaining, ah, it stays, maintaining the, um, um, like the sense of community and the, and the sense of family because we're, uh, we're missing being able to get on the mats and actually interact and laugh. And, and I know that for a lot of you, the Friday night classes, the winter night classes, they were, they were really pivotal social um, moments for you guys each week where, and for myself included, where we were, you get back together with friends and, and it's like you get to check in over the, the couple of days and, and so we're missing that. Make sure that you, um, you find a way of still reaching out to each other. So tonight we're going to be moving on to Hoshinden philosophy around the four primary elements. And I'm probably going to start in a couple of minutes. We'll give everyone like another two or three minutes <clears throat> to, uh, to join us. So... Before I plough into that, I hope that you're well. I hope that you've had a good uh, week. I know some of you I spoke, uh, I got to chat comments on Wednesday after the meditation in Qigong video. That was, that was a good night. I was, I was cooking after that class, <laughs> that session. I went home and I was just on fire, radiating. It was lovely, um, especially in the winter. Mm. Uh, Saturday was really fun to have our Zoom catch up. And I'd like to do that again in a couple of weeks, if everyone's up for that. Um, what else happened over the week? Ah, oh, I had heard back from some people about the Bolshurikum practice. That was cool. After the video I posted on, um, on Wednesday night, I got a few other videos from some students and their home backyard DIY Bolshurikum setups, which look awesome. <laughs> it's amazing what you guys have used to build um, targets and, and even the stands for targets and sitting away, you know, with angle grinders, grinding out old nails, just kind of fun. So I hope that you guys are keeping up some, some enjoyment. If you've got your home dojo take-home pack, your mat pack, with the nine square meters of mats and some training weapons, hopefully that's set up. I keep asking for people, you guys, to um, send me photos, and I think I've only got one or two at the moment of everyone's home dojo set up. So if you've got the mat pack, if you've got a little dojo set up, I'd love to see it. It's, um, it's exciting to see you guys using the equipment, using the gear, and actually setting, setting that up. So, uh, what are we at? One more minute. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll just roll on. Um, oh, it was a lot of fun on Wednesday in the, the meditation and Qigong discussion to, um, to have some of the, the banter back and forth, especially with um, Jeff, which is really lovely, having my old Hoshin teacher in the discussion. And I hope that I can encourage more of that. And I know that I promised um, a special uh, audio only upload to the Facebook group uh, before today, but that hasn't happened. So I'm gonna extend the goal to <laughs> this weekend. But I do have something pretty cool in mind for you guys that I think you'll get a kick out of. And, and hopefully it will also be educational and fun and keep you, what's the word? What do I say without giving too much of it away? Keep the enthusiasm of the study alive during this time. <laughs> I'll put that out there. Okay, <clears throat> so we'll just hit the ground running with tonight's topic. With the discussion that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago, where I was honing in on phases and qualities, I didn't necessarily identify the phases that, that we have here in Hoshinden, um, the names, the descriptors of those. I didn't go into a lot of great detail. What I wanted to do at that, in that instance was more to discuss the theoretical framework um, that went into making that up and to discuss the uh, ideas around 
what it is that I mean, the terminology to clarify terms um, and to clarify and to describe um, what my visions, what my pictures were with phases or qualities in this, this term because if I don't clarify that, then what happens is we get out of sync and I'm on the, match to, I'm on the mats in class talking about um, water phase and wind phase, metal phase, and, and the ideology in my head is going to be different from the interpretation that, that you guys have and we're gonna, it's just going to start peeling off, you know, like Chinese whispers. It doesn't take long for everyone to then form their own uh, opinions and ideas about what I must have meant rather than me clarifying what it is I actually intended. So, rehashing what it is that I mean by phases. I use the word phase when I'm talking about the Hoshin Den um, curriculum and the, and the qualities of study. I use the word phase rather than school or style or... Um, or I, do sometimes, I do often say, especially in the curriculum, I say the study of earth. Uh, quality, the study of metal quality, the study of fire quality, etc. And I use that language to hopefully get across that what the technical curriculum is about, well, what its purpose is, is to have an opportunity in the physical form to study the, advanta the, the advantages and disadvantages um, of a particular way of being, of a particular quality, of a particular state of mind, so that I could say this curriculum the, the, this particular part of the curriculum, the study of fire, is quite literally a physical and a psychological study, uh, meaning what I mean by study is um, practice, and an opportunity for practice, an opportunity for theoretical comprehension, and an opportunity for academic uh, discussion and um, disintegration, so that it can be observed and then reintegrated. Um, all of that is what I mean by study. The study of the fiery qualities, the fiery aspects. So we'll be studying the, the advantages and the disadvantages. When is it advantageous to, to adopt that kind of methodology and, and ideology, that mind state in reference to something? When is it disadvantageous? How do you know that it's, it's a time that it's going to be the good time for that? Um, what are some of the signs that maybe it's a bad idea to apply that type of mental uh, state or that methodology? What are some of the giveaways that mean that if you, if you, if you do make the mistake of, um, of applying an, uh, an unuseful or a disadvantageous response to a circumstance, what are some of the, the feedback mechanisms that you're going to get about that? Uh, and then what are you going to do about it? All of that stuff is wrapped up <clears throat> and, uh, and basically, mm, taught's not the right word, presented, <laughs> presented through the curriculum in what we would call the study of fire. It's literally, you know, a book, a couple of pieces of paper, and, and in it it might have um, some set techniques, some written taijutsu, some physical martial art techniques, and, uh, and then within, their, within those techniques, the expectation of developing certain psychological and philosophical understandings and stances come about so that in order to be effective in that way, in the fire, the study of fire, in order to apply some of the fire taijutsu, some of the fire body skills <clears throat> and the actual techniques in a, in a martial arts self-defense setting, um, I did that round the wrong way, in a self-defence martial arts setting, I should say. The, the goal of that is that in order to do that, in order to apply the physical martial art, you must develop either before or during or, or as, as a kind of co-creative part of, you must develop some of the psychological qualities that, that the fire phase are about. So then what happens is you have to abstract that further back. That describes what what the curriculum is for um, on that kind of level and, and helps to define the t my use of the word study or my use of the term study in that context. <clears throat> so the next question is like, well, what do I mean by, by the term fire, for example? Because that is open to interpretation. 
And one of the one of the errors of interpretation a few years ago when I first presented this was that, and it was probably an error on my part. It was definitely an error on my part. Um, uh, my language at the time, I hadn't yet clarified that I needed to to I needed to make it very clear that that these elemental qualities were metaphors and descriptives <clears throat> rather than um, the innate quality itself. And I think that that confusion in the student body probably came about through my own, um, my own lack of understanding in how the language was going to be interpreted. So to clarify, and then I've been, I've been kind of try, attempting to fix this up since about 2016. <laughs> and there's still bits of it in the dojo, I've noticed. So to clarify, when I use the, the elements as names, when we talk about the four primary elements, earth, fire, wind, and water, when I talk about that in the context of spiritual etymology or the spiritual development of philosophy <clears throat> or um, historical development of uh, spiritual ideologies and, and kind of theses of idea, um, then what I'm talking about are those elements in a social context and usually that's, that's either Celtic or uh, Japanese or, um, or ancient Chinese or Indian. And so it's still vague, but you know that I'm talking about the social ideas, um, a particular structure, and usually they're nature-based. So, so then we're talking about spiritual concepts in terms of um, the natural world systems. So the fire element, people immediately start thinking about volcanoes, um, bushfires, campfires, flames. Talk about the water element, people immediately start thinking about the ocean, about um, cups of water and tea, thinking about, uh, about you know, ice and, um, and blue things. Talk about the earth element, everyone suddenly gets pictures of gnomes and, um, and leprechauns and, and ideas of um, uh, Lord of the Rings style <coughs> mythos, I forgot if I call it that. <laughs> so in that context, that, that kind of language, I know it can be confusing when I go from that context to then immediately talking about the Hoshinden qualities and phases, and I call them the same thing. I say, oh, the fire phase, and then I talk about the, the development of spiritual thought and ideology from, from India up through Europe, and then discuss that and how we end up with earth, water, fire, and air, and, and um, spirit, Akasha, as this, this um, socially understood spiritual ideology in the background, regardless of people's um, religious viewpoints. So I know I, it can be confusing when I use the same terms, but I'm talking in different contexts. So my attempt for tonight is to clarify those terms. And I do this in class, but just for everyone, maybe for newer students who haven't had the benefit um, <laughs> of me really driving that home. And for everyone listening at home in 20,000 years from now. Um, <clears throat> so, I use the terms, in fact, I originally gathered the terms, um, the names of the, the element qualities, earth, fire, wind, water. Um, that's gathered from my study of Hoshin Jitsu, which, as far as I understand, comes from um, uh, come, actually, no, I can't even say that. Part of what I understand is that part of that comes from Glenn Morris's interaction with Stephen Hayes um, and his presentation of a Japanese idea, ideology, called the Gogyo or the Godai. But the Godai, Godai is seen as, uh, that's, I don't find that well mentioned, but the Gogyo is quite a, um, a well presented, as in it's presented often um, concept. And it's referring to five great principles, the five great precepts. And um, in that, those, they are literally called earth, the precepts of earth, water, fire, air, emptiness. And they reflect the five element system that 
comes from Mahayana Buddhism, and which is indicative of the five element system that we get in the Celtic European background. So that's where the language comes from. But when I'm using it to, to talk about a phase, like fire phase, I'm not meaning that we are moving like fire, like a flame. I'm not meaning that we are moving in the water phase like water. It's the other way around. Water is a representative that moves with these qualities, <clears throat> if that makes more sense. So in the water phase, for example, the, the water phase borrows qualities, or, or focuses rather, focuses in on qualities which substances that are liquid on earth exhibit as well. It could be the dihydrogen oxide that makes up the ocean. It could be um, molten metal. It could be lava. So the hot lava from a volcano, hot liquid you know, rock, that's going to have qualities that are liquid qualities. Those qualities are going to be different from the qualities of solid rock, yeah? And so, in effect, even though it's hot and it might be, um, <clears throat> it might be burning and it might, it might come from, it might be red, and these might be things that we associate with the fire phase, that's not, I don't mean to um, lead people down the path of assuming that, um, that all things that are, all things that are watery, must be blue or must be um, uh, tied to what we call water. It could be a sea of methane on another planet and it would have this liquid-like quality. Um, fiery things, for example, we could, get, we could say that, that um, the, the qualities of fire, forward moving, um, which in the, in the fire phase, they are most represented on earth by a flame, by an actual flame, an ignition flame. Um, but there are qualities of the fire phase that you will find in other earthly phenomena. Um, so that, for example, if we took water as another, like, I mean, um, literal water, the actual molecule, on earth and and we were to superheat that water uh, under some kind of maybe some kind of pressure chamber in a way that pushes it far above 100 degrees Celsius so that it becomes incredibly unstable but it's still liquid for a moment and then magically we take it out of that container and it explodes you know it, it instantly bursts and ignites then we could say well that that cup of liquid molecular water exhibited fiery qualities and it's in this way that I think the language can be very confusing and what I want to uh, really hone, put out there is that something I've intended to do which I will do but it hasn't happened yet don't expect it to happen for the next couple of years is and I've always wanted to do this I intend to rename all 12 of the phases with a completely new word and, and disassociate the elemental name from, the, from being the representative of that, that phase instead to being a, um, a descriptor or a metaphorical in, um, uh, manifestation of that, of that quality. And one of the, the trip-ups in that for me has been that I have uh, decided that I simply need to coin 12 new words, 12 new um, uh, combinations of letters and sound, or as sounds to more accurately give uh, kind of its own entity of presence to the qualities as I see them and then, and then be able to actually take something like, for example, if, if I rename water phase, here's just a hypothetical, don't, don't write this down, if I rename water phase, bawawa phase, <laughs> And then water, as we know it on Earth, is simply a, manifest, a manifested um, 
it manifests and exhibits the functions of those qualities. It's not to suggest that water is the primary manifestation of that, because we could say that, what did I even say? Did I say buwawa? Let's just go with buwawa. <laughs> and will only stand for the next five minutes. That um, water, tangible water, could be a reflect, could be a manifestation of the qualities of buwawa. And, and so too could lava. So too could liquid mercury. Um, so too could liquid methane. Yeah? So too could plasma, possibly, in the certain circumstances. So, so uh, my hope is that eventually I will clear up the, the misunderstanding by, by providing new words, <clears throat> a new layer of terms, and then taking the current elemental names and making them a subset, <clears throat> making them a, a descriptor um, or a, a metaphor rather than the, the actual name of that. So look out for that over the next couple of years, if that doesn't confuse you enough as it already is. <laughs> so, with that in mind, I'm now going to talk about the four um, primary elements, earth, water, fire, and <laughs> wind phase. I hope that you're laughing at home as much as I am. Um, <clears throat> I'm, for, the, for the purpose of this video, and probably for the next couple of years, I'm going to continue sticking to coining those, those phrases as I have done, um, especially for the current student body, because that's just, that's just the momentum of what we have going on. Yeah, when I call it water phase, the study of water phase, <clears throat> that's we, those of you who are Hoshin Den students, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not going to suddenly throw those names out the window for my own uh, long-term hope. That's, that's a different project. So tonight, I'm, the context is that I'm talking about the phases themselves as I see them. And I'm going to briefly explain how it is why it is that I, I perceive 12 phases um, and not a different number of, of a different mathematical number of phases, um, and also why it is how it is that they came about uh, in my thinking and in my, my what's the word exploration? Uh, sounds better than thinking, <laughs> makes me sound much more astute. Um, and, and then probably towards the end of the video, I'll actually get into the discussion of the four primary phases themselves. But, and then future videos, maybe next week, I'll talk about the secondary and tertiary phases. But uh, to start from scratch, the, this idea of qualities first came about for me from this, my study of Hoshin Jitsu. So where I started studying in the early 2000s, um, like 2000 or 2001, uh, I can't quite remember. I think it was 2001, actually with Jeff Smith uh, and, and a lot of my other teachers, um, Scott Braley, Tony Snedden, uh, Dominic Reichel, I never met him. He died shortly after I started, but he was a big component of Hoshin in that day. Glenn Morris was still alive at that time. Um, uh, Ed Martin was traveling and visiting our dojo in Sydney, <coughs> my teacher's dojo, Taravara Dojo. And I was studying with peers like, um, uh, Tim Brown, He Weeks, Lisa Lorimer, Michael Montalbano, um, oh, Robert, lovely Robert, man Robert, I can't, can't remember his surname top of my head right now, um, John Fitzgerald, who else? Come on, brain, it's only 20 years ago. Um, oh, Dylan Shanahan, and Graham Shepard, Peter King. <laughs> That's probably about does it for my sudden off-the-cuff name-dropping of people I trained with. So there was this crew of people, my, some of them were teachers, uh, Nick Davies, some of them were my teachers, some of them were, were peers, colleagues, and, and we were all studying Hoshin Jitsu under a system called the Hoshin Jitsu Australia Pacific, which was set up by my teacher at the time, um, Jeff, Jeffrey Smith, and his wife at the time, Rose Smith, Rosemary Smith, and... They, they established that as a system originally underneath Glenn Morris's uh, American system, the Hoshin Roshi Rujutai Jitsu, which was the overarching umbrella organization. And I think that was in 1994, don't quote me on the dates. <clears throat> 1997, again, don't quote me on the dates, uh, is when, I think, is when uh, Jeff and Rose uh, split from the Hoshin Roshi Rujutai Jitsu system, from Glenn's system. And they formulate, they form their own Australian unique system called the Hoshin, Hoshin Jitsu under their umbrella organization, Hoshin Jitsu Australia Pacific. So, what happens at that point is you get the separation out between the American system and the Australian system becomes, 
becomes created. And, and it still carries with it a lot of the structures and the systems, especially the grading system, from the American uh, Ruha. So you get, you get rainbow colored belts, um, you get this rainbow wheel logo, <clears throat> you, get, you get things like um, uh, the, the earth, what do they call it? Oh, you're taxing my memory. Um, the, oh, the study of earth? Principles of Earth. I remember we used to get these books, these fantastic curriculum books that were that were hefty books, um, and it was things like the was it the elements of nature, the elements of fire, the elements of Earth. So they were effectively dividing up the grading, the, the literal belt grade colours <clears throat> into uh, the the what we call phases. So so for example, the red belt level, <clears throat> all of the techniques, all the physical martial art techniques that were grading curriculum for the red belt in order for you to get your red belt and then your red belt white stripe which was the intermediate and then progress through to your next belt <clears throat> they were all contained in a book called the earth study or something like that the the elements of earth from memory and then the same thing happened the next level up so the orange and the orange uh, orange belt and orange belt white stripe course or, or part of the curriculum those belts and literally an orange belt that you tie on all of the martial art techniques that you needed to study the, in, as grading, they were, they were contained, all of those pieces for grading requirements, requirements for orange belt, orange belt, white stripe, they were in a book <clears throat> called The Elements of Water or The, the, the Study of Water. Memory. <clears throat> Same thing, you move up again. The yellow belt, I think they used to call it gold belt in, um, in early, like 2000 Toshin, and that was that again, all of the all of the martial art techniques, all the physical form techniques, things like okay, escape from this wrist grab, uh, onikadaki, mushidori, mushidori, uh, etc. Different like um, defense against knife, defense against uh, up against wall, defense against hambo, multiple attacker. It was like a, a grading curriculum. It was it, all of those techniques that you needed to be able to demonstrate proficiency in, in order to get your yellow belt your gold belt, sorry, in that part, they were all contained and written in a book called Elements of Fire, or the Study of Fire. And then so on and so forth, you had um, the green belt, the elements of wind, and then the blue and purple belt were put together from memory called the Elements of Nature, I think, Study of Nature, or the Study of Natural Elements, something like that. So you had these five books that Jeff and Rose had produced, and they were, they were grading curriculum for each of the belts. And literally, as you move through each book, you got a belt, um, that, that was your grading, and you moved on. So once you, once you got up to um, the, the orange belt study, you'd effectively finished the red belt study, and that book would kind of go on the shelf. And in the orange belt curriculum, most, from memory, it would contain most of the most of the techniques and the work from the previous grades, I think. And so they built that up, um, at least until the, the green belt and the blue belt. I think the purple belt was very short because it was expected that you could go back and read the book. So in that system, they had these names, the elemental names were intact, borrowed from the, the American system. And the, um, the idea of associating those to particular levels of study was intact, borrowed from the American system. They were used um, to kind of define belt grades, from my opinion, rather than um, uh, qualities of those elements, rather than uh, a really overt observation of the pros and cons of those. Um, they, were, they were used as kind of um, grouping terms. And I'm sure that higher up there was still an understanding that they were, they were mental states, they were states of mind. And I do have good, I've got some good memories of um, when I was very lucky and I used to have some one-on-one -on -one training with, with Jeff Smith. Uh, I, I have some memories of Saturday morning classes in his dojo where when it was raining so heavily that uh, no one else turned up. <laughs> it was just him and I, lucky me. I had like an hour and a half, two hour classes of, um, or hour and a half classes of just, just sensei and myself. And, and I have vivid memories of doing um, sparring meditations, evoking 
basically drawing some of the things we do, like um, uh, evoking quality feelings of earth, of fire, of water, of wind, and then taking those into sparring with Jeff or, or approaching um, weapon carters from those different states of mind. So I don't know if that's something that um, the other students got. It certainly wasn't anything that I ever found written in the curriculum. So I don't know if, if it was just my lack of the draw that Jeff, I got that kind of training from Jeff. So obviously it was something that was in Jeff's mind in order for him to then present that to me. Uh, but from, from that, we kind of get this idea of how it is that I, I began to build the Hoshin Den system. So um, I'm a student of, Ho I was a student of Hoshin Jitsu from 2001, I think, right up until 2013. Um, I study in Sydney, not a terribly great amount of time, from 2001 until 2005, mid-2005, June 2005. Um, which is when I then leave, I go on a, a trip around Australia for a year, I return, um, I, I'm there for a few months in 2006, still training with Jeff. Glenn Morris dies at, in 2006, in April, on April the 1st, 2006. Um, and then at that time I've moved, I then moved to Melbourne and, um, and I think, don't quote me, but later that year that's when Jeff uh, and Rose, their marriage, or their, their relationship ends quite quite clearly um, and then in 2007 I think the um, the school separates off again into kind of Jeff's uh, the school that Jeff takes and sets up again and the school that uh, his ex-wife takes Rose takes and sets up again and um, and so it's really only from 2001 to sort of say the start of 2006 that um, that I'm really heavily involved in uh, my study with Jeff it's not a long time. Some of you guys who are watching, some of my Hoshin Den students, you've been training with me longer than I got to train with, with um, Jeff. And that should be terrifying for you. <laughs> <coughs> if you're following this conversation at all, you should be very worried. So um, what happened was in about 2000, and this is a really good history for me to even pull this out of my brain. Um, in 2006, I want to say 2006, but it actually was probably 2007. Um, I'd still been in contact with Michael Montalbano. Now, Michael Montalbano was a Hoshin Jitsu student. He and I uh, were colleagues, we were peers. We, we studied together for many years and uh, we were very close for a chunk of time. I haven't spoken for a long time now. Um, he, he started studying uh, New Linguistic Programming, NLP. And, um, and the counselling forms of that, set up his own business doing that in Sydney. I had been off um, continuing my study of Iyengar yoga and, um, and Indian um, mythos and, and uh, spiritual ideology, di dialogue, dialoguing, modern kind of philosophy, but from a spiritual or a theosophical perspective, really. And what happened was in 2007, if it was 2007, Michael and I got back in touch um, and we, we just had lots of discussions about this idea that maybe the curriculum, maybe the Hoshin Jitsu curriculum, as it had been, these books I was talking about, could be updated in a way to really shine a light on the, the mental state or the state of mind that these particular elements, these elemental names were, were possibly reflecting. And um, I can't speak for Michael because I, I don't, uh, I don't know the ins and outs of what was going on for him, but I know for me what I discovered more and more in my other study was, was how un, I found it very unclear that, that there were these terms that were used, but um, I didn't know what they were relating to. And it was only through my, my personal study with Jeff and the, the special one-on-one -on -one sessions that I got to have with him. And I managed to have a lot of those. I don't know what everyone else was doing. Um, that it's only from those that I actually had an understanding, my own training, that I could I could evoke frames, reference frames of thinking. I could I could view a particular sparring scenario with someone, and I'd use this in the Thursday night sparring classes in Sydney back when we used to have them, the Hoshin sparring nights. Um, that it was like, okay, here's someone. I'd watch them get up, and and maybe they were my my new sparring partner. I'd take a moment, I'd breathe, and I'd I'd adjust the my response mechanisms. 
by changing my state of mind. I'd adjust into a more watery response or a more fiery response. And it was a very, very beginning. Uh, it was the very beginning of me starting to formulate that, uh, those ideas in my head back then. That was probably 2003, 2004. Um, and so then, I said 2007, I had long wanted to find a way of further clarifying for the Hoshin Jitsu curriculum, because I was still an active member um, in, up between Melbourne and Sydney a lot, getting involved in classes, doing relief teaching. Um, I'd been a children's and teacher and teens teacher there, and then um, I was doing adult teaching at the end of my time there in 2005, um, four, five, yeah. Um, what was I saying? So uh, I, for a long time, wanted to find a way of, um, of presenting this idea that it wasn't just that you got your red belt, you moved on to orange belt, and then you took all this earth quality and you just kind of put it in a bench and you put the book away and you didn't really think about it ever again. And now you moved on to water quality and that somehow as if they were, as if they were stacked in a way that made them um, uh, some kind of hierarchy of, of betterness, you know. Oh, well, earth is below water, so I've moved on from earth. I'm better now. I, I'm a watery martial artist. Oh, well, you know, I've moved on now. I'm a fiery martial artist. That's, that, that, ba that beats earthy and fiery responses. So I've moved on, and now I'm a windy martial artist. Now, now, I'm, now I'm above the restrictions of the earthy, watery, fiery way. Oh, I've moved on. Now I'm just a spirit emptiness martial artist. I'm beyond the need of these. And, and I found that very arrogant, that concept, that, um, that there was some particular pinnacle. And I'm laughing because I know behind us we'll have the stupid that we drew from last week. Um, this idea that that there's particular qualities or ways of beings that are innately better. And um, for a while, I, lots of thinking of that led me to understand that <clears throat> there are probably just particular phases and there are probably particular uh, states of mind that are contextually better or circumstantially more advantageous. And that's where I started to develop the language around advantageous and disadvantageous um, to express my thinking about what the qualities were why they were useful and how I could actually better bring them out into, into a tangible uh, teaching method. So I go back to my story with Michael Montalbano. 2007, we get together and um, I'm, invent I'm invited, I can't quite remember how, <laughs> but somehow I ended up being invited to present a movement uh, therapy workshop uh, in Canberra at, uh, at like a, a, a cultural festival where uh, there were lots of other movement activities. Possibly there were yoga and um, there was some Tai Chi Chuan activities. And, and so I was invited uh, and I'm not quite, I really can't think of how, <laughs> how, can't quite remember how, but um, I, I was invited as a martial artist to present a movement therapy workshop. Um, and straight away I got in touch with Michael and I said, hey, I've been invited to do this thing um, I know that you and I have very similar hopes that what we really want to do is we'd like to see the, the Hoshin Jitsu curriculum be able to, to shine a light on this more and express this in, better, in a much better term um, for other students and for our own sense of understanding. Do you want to work together in developing kind of like a bit of a, a, bit of a, a trial course? We've only, it was a two-day workshop, um, so we had, we had some students who'd enrolled over like a Saturday and a Sunday. And, and Michael said, yep, great. So we got together, I think we had some discussions, we had lots of emails back and forth from his NLP perspective. So what he brought to that match, to that, that setup, were things like um, the, the language that he was developing in order to express concepts uh, relating to the five elements, the, the uh, ideas of uh, creating meditations and, um, and his framework of using NLP and linguistic programming language to, to evoke from the students at that workshop um, um, imaginations, ima imaginings that would draw an emotional response. And so you're starting to see the beginning of, of emotions associated to particular elements and qualities. And what I brought to that were actual activities that, that worked into that, that method. So I presented um, yoga forms and asana, dance activities, uh, movement activities, I created actual martial art techniques and, and taijutsu and Michael and I worked together to find out how to get, how he could use language and I could use movement for us to get the student body together in that weekend workshop to have an experience one at a time of the five 
um, elements. Now, what, in, what came of that was a really good feedback. Uh, those, the, the students in the, the workshop, we got lots of feedback and it was like a, an expensive workshop. They paid a lot of money to come to that workshop and, and we had them over two days. Uh, I had emails from them over the following weeks about how much they loved it, how much they got out of it, how much it had kind of given them a framework for some other parts of their life, especially because they were already creative types. They had backgrounds in yoga, in art, in art therapy, stuff like that. So, and in music. So Michael and I kept collaborating <clears throat> and, um, and what, well, we didn't, we intended to do some more of those workshops. It didn't come to fruition. That was the only one. And what happened was I took the work that he and I had developed together and with his permission, I then went, uh, I was at a, another festival, probably, I'm going to say it was 2006. Oh my God, I can't remember all the years. Um, I might have mixed up the dates of Michael and I doing that thing. He definitely did this before I did my second festival. 2006 or seven, I'll triple check the dates somehow and find them out for you. Um, a month or two after Michael and I do this festival in Canberra, I end up at another uh, cultural festival um, at Confest, actually, the Victorian New South Wales Conference Festival. And that was, that was an Easter festival. And I, it's a festival where people can present workshops and, um, and there's you know, 10,000 people to attend them over a week. So I thought, hey, what a great opportunity for me to try this out again. And what I did was I, I present, I put up on the, the timetable, I present a workshop called the Elemental Arts Workshop. And what I had was my framework of the work that Michael and I had put together, where I had, I had some language um, from his NLP development. I had uh, some meditations uh, that he had helped, that we developed together. And I had my movement activities and my, my concepts of using physical movement to, to help the individuals or the students to actually experience um, what I intended by the terms earth, water, fire, air, spirit. So that elemental um, arts workshop only ran for about two and a half, three hours on one day. I had over 150 participants <laughs> somehow. And again, I got raving feedback, incredible feedback, brilliant feedback from people who... Um, who some of, some of who later I became very good friends with, uh, who might be watching this video. And, and feedback from them about, again, how that had provided them a bit of a framework. They hadn't really had activities before um, where they they directly developed relationships. And that was a key word that I, I found kept being repeated about relationships and dynamics with, with these elements. They'd gone from kind of abstract um, uh, social frameworks and ideas into something tangible, something you could actually relate with, something you could talk with, something you could dance with and dialogue with and have a, have a relationship with. Um, therefore gain benefit from and, and, uh, and grow with, yeah? So what happened was I took that, I was like, wow, there's something there. <laughs> something here, obviously. I took all that and then um, I was still very involved in Hoshin Jitsu at the time. I think I was back in Sydney at one point and, um, and I, Michael and I were very excited about this, and I said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just take a stab in the dark at designing a curriculum that might present this idea in a little bit more um, uh, direct, directness, with, with more directness. And, um, and my first couple of attempts were probably pretty terrible. From about 2008, I, so obviously I started Raining Spirit Dojo in 2009, 1st of May 2009. Um, so from that point, I was teaching the existing Hoshin Jitsu curriculum, but with effectively my, my experiment on top, could I continue to, to add in, sprinkle on top of that curriculum, flavors of little peppers of um, extra activities that were above the base curriculum that I thought might help the, the Hoshin students, my Hoshin students, to, to get a glimpse into the relationship and to, um, and to actually really have personal and tangible experiences of these five elements. You know, they weren't just the names of the books that we were, or the names of the belts that we were um, kind of abstractly moving through. So, um, and yes, uh, you can hear my, my criticism, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, so what happened, what, what that developed into was 
so at that point in time, Jeff uh, and his ex-wife had gone in separate ways. Jeff had left the Hoshin and um, Jitsu Australia Pacific and was teaching his own thing. And, um, uh, and wanting to be involved in Hoshin, especially after Glenn had died, I continued my Hoshin interaction, which meant that, um, Hoshin Australia interaction, which meant that I was um, involved with uh, Jeff's ex-wife, Rose Smith. So Rose had become the, the head of Hoshin. She, she'd taken over the school in that way. Um, and she was still teaching out of a dojo in Avalon Beach in Sydney, where I grew up, and as well as a few other locations. She had a few other people with her. She had Michael Montalbano, she had um, Scott Braley, and, uh, and Robert, lovely. I can't quite remember his surname right now. Um, so, so she had this little team of people who were working with her, and effectively they were still also running off the original Hoshin Jitsu syllabus. And, and the agreement that she and I had was that um, at the Rainy Spirit Dojo in Melbourne, I'd be allowed to grade my students in, the, in Hoshin Jitsu belts and grades. She would ratify those as the head of the style at that time. And, um, and that I was welcome to, to build on top of the curriculum, of my curriculum, extra activities that I saw fit, but they couldn't be used as grading requirements. And I said, fair enough, because that obviously, if it was all one grading system, her students wouldn't have studied those things. And so they couldn't become um, requirements for grading. I said that was fine. And we just kind of continued in that vein. <clears throat> so what happened was that uh, progressively over the years, the Reigning Spirit Dojo syllabus from about 2009 till, till mid-2013 became increasingly um, uh, uh, added onto <clears throat> by, by me with lots of qigong and, um, and breathwork activities, uh, going back and extracting a lot of... A lot of Hoshin Roshi Ruju Taijutsu practices, the energy work from Dr. Porter, the importer there, um, <clears throat> and, and Glenn's books and work. And I was extracting a lot more of that and putting it back into, um, putting it into the Rain Spirit Dojo curriculum, all on top of the Hoshin Jitsu study. And, and then I had already, maybe around 2010, 2011, um, I'd come up with this vague idea. What if, what if we took this syllabus, instead of these books based on, on belts, so instead of just the red belt book that was effectively all the techniques and, and syllabus requirements for red belt, and we called it the earth book, and then we moved on to another book that was just for orange belt, and each one became kind of an isolated island in and of itself, I thought. I said to the, I was part of the little um, Hoshin Jitsu teaching committee during the, those years, <clears throat> I said to the other members of that, hey, what if, what if, could we envision a syllabus where, where instead of, instead of just separating by belt, we separate them by focus quality. And, and rather than just saying, okay, here's the red belt syllabus. This is, um, these are the rolling techniques. This is the, um, uh, the taijutsu techniques. This is the weapon technique. This is the hambo technique, blah, 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 blah. These are the philosophies. <clears throat> what if we juggled it around and we had a new syllabus that said, this is the earth book you can see where i'm going with this um, and in it we say these are the these are the red belt earth techniques these are the orange belt earth techniques these are the gold belt earth techniques green belt and so on and so on and my hope was that what the curriculum would focus on would be rather than focusing on the techniques of the belt grade they'd be focusing on the techniques of the the quality the, the elemental uh, denomination and that and in that way, I thought that it would cause the students to more appropriately focus onto the element uh, of study. And what I mean by that is frame of mind of study ra and the qualities of that rather than the color of the belt. Yeah. So that it wasn't just an arbitrary. It wasn't just that the word earth was associated arbitrarily to the red belt study. It was that you were very inherently studying earth and that you could see that there were earthy qualities which were flicked through techniques in the red belt, the orange belt, the yellow, the gold belt, the green belt, etc. Um, now that, that in its infancy was a very poorly constructed uh, idea when I first presented it. It was just literally some, some scribblings of mine on some paper. Um, and, and so it wasn't taken up. And it wasn't taken any further with that group. I think I presented it maybe one more time in 2012 or 13 from memory. A little bit more fleshed out, <clears throat> but it's it was still kind of decided that that it wasn't even up for discussion. So what happened was when we get to uh, September two thousand thirteen, which is when um, Rose and I go in our awesomely separate ways, 
And as a result, I take Reigning Spirit Dojo off in a, in a different um, direction and Rose takes, Rose Smith takes the, her Hoshin Jitsu group off, probably just in the direction it was heading in anyway. And, um, and, and as part of that, part of the fallout of that whole uh, experience, as I uh, didn't manage that, I didn't manage my interpersonal relationship very well there with Rose. So as a, as a fallout of that, um, we kind of started from scratch. Yeah, I, I didn't have a curriculum to, to continue teaching. And some of you who are watching uh, will remember <laughs> the exact class in September 2013. We're at the old Hurstbridge Scout Hall when I sat you down and told you about <laughs> what had just happened. Um, or the, the outcomes, what was going on. And, um, and that we had, you know, basic sparring and strikes and, uh, and we had fitness and rolling, but we no longer had a, a curriculum, a grading curriculum. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You remember, Stephen. Um, so what happened then was it took, me, it took me about a month or two, maybe even two or three months, to really uh, regather my, my thoughts. And once we hit sort of January 2014, that was when I realised I actually already had the, the skeleton framework for the curriculum for, for, the, for the structure that I wanted in order to present what I thought was the important learning focus, which was to cause the students to focus in on the inherent qualities of the techniques, not to learn the techniques in order to, to progress through the belt grades. And, um, and my hope was that what it would do was it would, it would further heighten what the common threads or the common themes were between these techniques, regardless of the, the level of study, whether it was white belt or yellow belt or black belt or fifth down, that if they were all in one book, so to speak, if they were all in one area of study, such as the study of earth, I was hoping that the students would therefore realise there was a commonality to those techniques. And the commonality there meant that if you were uh, a fifth down student studying techniques from the study of earth and so too there were white belt students studying techniques and you're all actually studying the same body of work my hope was that it would it would show people that there's obviously a depth of study there's there's uh, an ability to to broaden and deepen the the understanding of those principles and those those qualities not that you just studied oh, uh, escape from opposite wrist grab and you went tick and then you did it and you did it enough, proficiently enough to get graded and then you were done and then you never ever went and visited it ever again because, you know, you were a god at that now. My hope was that you, you were kind of constantly reminded that you were just eternally rubbish and eternally trying to catch up. And if you're at the fifth down level, you're trying to catch up to the depth of study in the earth syllabus, the earth study. In the same way that the white belt is, you're just catching up to different different types of understanding, but you're still kind of, you know, it's just like the water's over your mouth, but you can breathe through your nose kind of thing. Um, so thank you, Stephen, for your comment. Um, what came out of that was this, this understanding that what I wanted to do was hone in on these things because I thought they were, I thought that the elements were legitimate um, opportunities for developing relationship dynamics with as a human being as archetypal um what's the word as an archetypal representation of qualities and values that exist throughout time so that for the human much in the way because i'm a i'm a, a fervent student of jung um psychology and philosophy that that in this idea that there are archetypal um, values or there are archetypal experiences which just propagate the human experience as a whole. And whether you're born now or 5,000 years from now or 10,000 years ago, there are key archetypes that are reflected and we, we might um, contextualise those and metaphorise those. Thank you, Stacey. Um, might metaphorise those into the modern context, but... But effectively, some of, those, some of those archetypes just play out. They live true, and it's to do with our biology and our neurology, and so they're always there. My hope was that with that Jungian perspective married in to um, the, actual, the actual elements themselves as almost like an archetypal entity that we can dialogue with and engage with, um, almost like a role-playing psychology, that we can use that to actually learn and actually develop our, our 
those, those qualities of ourselves so that when people were studying the earth study, they weren't just learning techniques for the purpose of learning techniques. They were learning taijutsu. They were studying techniques in order to develop within them the archetypal, the, the relationship with the archetype of earth qualities. And when they move on and study, when they study the water phases, the water phase study, or rather, I'll say it again, the study of water phase, <laughs> the language, um, what they're actually doing is through the physical techniques, through the psychological development, they're actually just further, furthering their own personal relationship with the archetype of that quality and the benefits that it, can, that it can provide by becoming innately aware of that. Because I am a fervent believer that, I do believe that um, if, you, if there are aspects occurring uh, within us, if we assume that there are aspects occurring within us, then either we are the victim of those aspects or we are the master of those aspects. And the only way to, to um, arrive on either side of that is to actually enter into dialogue and, and discussion, enter into exploration of those qualities within us. And since I believe that, yes, it is true that there are, there are these, um, these infinite potentials within us, I think that it is important for each human, to, each human being to head into the caves that are dark and to strike up conversations with the aspects of self that are concerning or that are... Um, worrying or even nauseating <laughs> so that I, I'm not, I don't become a victim of my own attempted goodness. I really sit down and I, I come up face to face with the fact that in these, in these scenarios I'm a wimp. In these scenarios I'm, I'm a tragic failure at my attempt to, to uh, I don't know, leverage or get, get whatever it is that I'm trying, do whatever I'm trying to do. Uh, or that in these scenarios um, I always crumble, you know. Come up in that and have a discussion. Because you can only run away from that for so long. And for the entire time that you run away from it, you're simply a victim of that circumstance, yeah. You turn there and have a discussion and go, okay, let's chat. And there's some pain and there's usually some tears and there's a lot of soul searching. But what comes from it is this ability to, to gain a sense of ownership and control of those, those aspects and then use them. Take them and make them um, tools, you know, temper them into, into powerful objects. And then they become another, another tool in your toolbox. So the hope being that the, say for example, the study of the four primary elements, the study of the earth, the fire, the wind, the water um, phases, is to take us as humans through effectively forced dialogue <laughs> You know, because I change every month, this month, that month, that month. So if you come to class, you have no choice, but to, you're being forced to dialogue with these aspects. And within these archetypal quality, within these archetypal uh, relationships, there are aspects of ourselves that we find. Some of them we like, some of them we don't like. So those who are more watery individuals, those, what I mean by that is those who identify more with watery qualities and aspects, um, or those, those liquid qualities. Um, they, they are obviously far more at home with having dialogue with the archetypal uh, personifications and anthropomorphizing those personifications <clears throat> with water than they are with fire. When we get six months around and we're studying the fire phase, those people who were really all onto it and too, they turned up to class confident and, and you know, they were, get their teeth sunk into the water phase, they're a little bit shy in, and they, they have trepidation. And hesitation in the fire phase and that's that's simply because maybe the fire phase archetypes the, the qualities they in they inherently contain within them are aspects of ourselves that we are still unwilling to um, to dialogue with or maybe we're fully aware that we really need to dialogue with that part of ourselves but um, we think that in order to do so it will destroy our sense of self or it will it will eradicate all of our relationships and our wives and husbands will leave and people will realize that I really am an evil horrible person and and then we get into these these actual um looking at what the actual motivations are of avoiding avoiding these things so I'm aware that we're out of time I'm going to wrap it up uh, and I haven't actually really talked about the four um <laughs> primary <laughs> elements 
<laughs> Maybe I'll retitle the video. Um, but I hope that that gives a really clear beginning for that discussion of how it is that I actually arrived at, um, at, this, idea, at this, this framework in order to present these ideologies, where these ideologies come from, what it is that I hope these ideologies can do, uh, what the purpose is, and, and really long term, why it is that I want to continue to develop um, not just the physical taijutsu aspects of the art, but also the, the cognitive understanding, the academic presentation, the, the sort of broader philosophical um, perspective, uh, and be able to even write down and, and maybe write a book of ideologies, you know, of Hoshin Den philosophy, so that it, it can be very clear what my thoughts are and then stemming from that the ability for, for others who are interested or maybe people who, um, uh, who end up using, using this art as almost like a form of art therapy, a form of, um, of uh, psychoanalyzing, psychoanalytic study. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, that, that if it becomes a tool that they could find, that they find has value, it's not, it's, it's, it's easy to find, it's, it's there, it's super solid, <laughs> you know, it's like there, you can get in and, and if someone comes up to you in a hundred years and, uh, and maybe, maybe, I don't know, you're, they come and they talk to a student who's the fifth generation student of one of mine uh, and the rest of us are all dead and, um, and this person comes up and they say, I've, I've heard about these things, I've heard about these ideas and concepts, um, I struggle a lot in these ways in my life, um, I've... I've heard people talk about how they, stud they, they did this, they studied these practices and it led to this development of their character. Um, what do I do? That this, that this Hoshin Den teacher can go, oh, great, I've got an entire curriculum. This is what you have to do. This is what you're going to do physically for 10 years, 20 years, or five months, who knows. This is what you're going to do physically. You're going to go and you're going to do this. And, and as, you, as, you take, as you work through these activities physically, these are the things that you will probably discover about your experience along the way. These are the signposts that have been marked by the people who came before you as they took those paths of exploration. And, and as you're needing support um, uh, philosophically for the interpersonal uh, trauma <laughs> that is coming from that, um, I, because I've also tread those paths, I'm here and, and able to dialogue with you. And this is the framework of dialogue. This is the underpinning ideology that the, that the dialogue is, stands upon. Um, and these are the goals and these are the expected outcomes. And it becomes, effectively, my hope is that it becomes a science of psychoanalysts, an, an psychoanalytical study. And something that uh, has always been close to my heart something that Glenn Morris wrote in one of his books, probably in his first book, was his hope that the, the profession or the, um, the, the path, like the occupation of the warrior mystic will one day become um, seen to be as legitimate as any other field of work. So that the development of the individual to... to allow there to be a human being who is capable of presenting these kinds of activities and dialoguing in this manner and, um, and, and having answers to the questions that, that other people might seek suddenly in times of distress, that that, that path is, will hopefully be seen to be as legitimate as uh, banking or being a lawyer or a doctor um, in the way that we now, in the modern context, we now start to see um, uh, counselling and psychology becoming no longer just... I mean, think back 100 years ago. That, that, that was a fringe field of, um, of effectively, you know, possibly very Jungian um, theorists who are like kind of seen as um, uh, side bonus things, you know. But I mean, but really, real work is, you know, brickwork and uh, plumbing. And you're like, well, what we find now is we can't discount the incredible, um, the incredible contributions and, and, and benefits that we can find from the people 
who have actually put aside time in their lives to answer some of those, those deep personal questions. So when the king of the country falls into, you know, when his country falls into mess and he's, he's been very busy, you know, governing his country, he hasn't spent 30 years sitting on a mountain um, view, viewing personal philosophy of what it is to be alive. Who does he go to when all the shit hits the fan? Well, he goes up the mountain and seeks the advice of these people. That's why you end up with these, these Buddhist stories over centuries, millennia. And they're all things like, one day the king comes to visit the monk. Or the prince of this thing leaves his castle. And it, what they're trying to get across is this idea that um, the, this, this kind of personal introspective dialogue into self-discovery is of absolutely no importance until the moment when it's infinitely important. And then what happens is someone needs to have done that. Someone in the human society, just like how we need plumbers and we need bricklayers, um, we need bakers, you know, we need farmers. Someone has to be motivated to those careers or else we all starve to death. Someone has to be motivated to house building careers or we all live out in the rain freezing, yeah? So eventually, it's like what we need is someone, some people have to feel their own personal motivation and draw towards these areas of internal development so that they have something of value and they've developed something of worth to present to the society. And my, my goal, and we'll find out, you let me know in 100 years if this even works, um, my goal is that Ho Shin Den can be a platform, a framework of something to produce that has value, that has worth to others. And it's presented in a way that is very systematic. It's clear for the most part. It's, um, it, has, it has a body of work. It has an academic uh, backing to it. Like it, it has a, um, a scientific approach to its exploration and its, um, its development over time. And then you've got, you've got something, you've got, a, you've got a product. You've got a tangible, solid loaf of bread that you can give to people who are starving for meaning or starving for personal uh, answers in an identity crisis, etc. So I'll leave it there. I'm only 10 minutes over. <laughs> I hope that that was fun. I'm really enjoying these videos. Um, maybe we'll be lucky and next week I'll actually talk about the four primary elements. I don't know. We'll see how I feel then. Um, feel free to stay on and comment after the video. I'll stick around for another five minutes for, on Facebook. I hope that you're all doing really well. Uh, lots of love to you all. It's been really fun. I really enjoyed Wednesday night, the, the dialogue that went on there during the meditation video. That was fun. And last um, Saturday, I loved the Zoom party that we got to have. So if everyone's up for that, um, again, maybe in a couple of weeks, that would be awesome. If any of you have any needs, definitely reach out. Uh, if there's anything that I can help with, you know, I can't help you with your plumbing right now. So don't ask me for that. But um, if any of you are finding that at this time, you do actually have questions uh, that are about the self, philosophies, and questions about the I, then write to me. You know, you've got my email address, uh, I'm on this page, you've got me through Facebook Messenger, etc., and I'm available and uh, love entering into those dialogues as I know that a lot of you, um, a lot of you have had the, the opportunity to chat with me in person um, uh, when, when things go south. And uh, I want to remind those, those who have, have, have already been messaging me and emailing me, but I want to remind those who maybe haven't realised that it's an option and the newer students, I'm, I'm here, I'm available, and uh, my role as the head of the school is to be here, and I am available. I might not get back to you immediately, but um, I will dialogue with you, so reach out. Have an awesome night. Lots of love. Stay well. Enjoy isolation and um we've got one more week of april so happy anzac day tomorrow 25th of april i will see you on the other side of this week wednesday although i will i promise i'll get that little special super surprise audio upload um between now and then so keep your eye on the page bye